Okay, so the next moving to um, 546, which is um, an act relating to racial justice statistics. Uh, and my understanding is that Eric is not available until uh, two to do the, is that correct? Um, I don't, if Coach and Martin, do you want to take a quick break? Do you want to, do you want to lay the, lay the groundwork or the kind of the foundation of the next draft? What, what's, what's best? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, you definitely want to have a discussion on this. Um, and could point out uh, the few changes that uh, we did discuss the other day and, and that this does, <coughs> does implement. Um, so, um, okay, so Coach, is that yeah. the work for the, for the two of you to, to talk about the changes and do sure. a walkthrough now? Sure. Do a walkthrough now in, in Eric's um, absence? Okay, just want to make sure that um, everybody has, it should be draft 4.1 of H546, correct? Yeah. So everybody got it? You can go ahead and start, Martin. I'm just gonna uh, check yeah. and make sure so, I get a copy. Yeah, but the, the two biggest, uh, changes. Um, one has to do with the makeup of the advisory panel, uh, and the other has to do with uh, the makeup of the division itself. And uh, you can see as far as uh, with respect to the advisory panel, uh, this draft would eliminate... What page do you want, Martin? Uh, page seven and eight. Um, this takes the number of members of this advisory council down from 20 to seven members, and it focuses on the uh, communities that are impacted uh, by the uh, disparities, primarily in the criminal justice system. Uh, so it, it takes away all the individuals who represented the organizations uh, related uh, to or providing information into the system. Uh, it eliminates them. Um, I am noticing, I think that, that we still have one change that I don't see that Eric has put into this latest draft and we can ask him about that, that we wanted to make clear that these entities, oh, I'm sorry, they're there. I apologize, page 10. Uh, th this, this provides, it makes it clear that these entities are to provide somebody uh, for the council to be able to consult with uh, on an as needed basis. Uh, so that, that's what, so we moved the uh, providers of the data into this liaison role and really kept the council itself uh, focused narrowly. So we've also, you know, one of the, in testimony with respect to the advisory council, we did, we did uh, consider and we talked about uh, the possibility of having uh, expanding uh, the current uh, racial equity. Uh, there's a panel that is within the Office of Racial uh, equity, equity, I'm sorry. And we talked a little bit about whether we should just expand the role in the membership. And there were a couple of issues with that. Number one is that the primary purpose of this advisory panel in, the, in this context of this bill is to provide some independence, some independent oversight. This was something very important to RDAP uh, in its recommendations. Uh, and putting it within the office itself as it currently is, it's less independent, reports directly to the governor instead of reporting to the, uh, the director of racial equity. That's one point. The other is it's gonna be the same number of people that we would be foisting on this already five member panel. Let's keep this very focused uh, on the data and the data analysis, not give them all the other responsibilities because this other panel has a lot of different responsibilities. This would be very focused just on, on the data uh, gathering, uh, aggregation and, and analysis. So, so that's, that's why we put this where it is, but would love to, of course, before we jump onto the other component, if there is any input 
on, on what we've done here, if uh, this is coming along to where people want to see this go or, or if there's something else that needs to be done with that. So I'll start because I'm sure you're waiting for me to go. Always. So basically all you did was you took a bunch of positions and you put them over here and you relabel them and do a liaison or however you pronounce it, but you're still gonna have a strong position which you've already got set up with the administration through Susanna to answer to the governor already. So I don't see where you've done anything with that because Susanna is already dealing with all these different uh, groups anyway. And you're, I'm going to, I believe I said this before, I'm going to say it again. You're already reinventing the wheel that's already there. She already has herself, and the governor has already approved two other positions that we cannot fill the third position now. We cannot handle the existing data. We do not share the existing data. So why we are doing this is it makes, I understand what you're trying to accomplish, but we're already doing it to as much as can be handled right now. And we're making progress, not near the progress that needs to be done, but we, we are really rushing things through. You already have uh, Susanna there. And I, I, I still, um, um, uh, which, you know, what is her, um, I'm skipping out here. Her title is the, the head of the racial, Executive Director of Racial Equity. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, you're doing a whole new bill on something that's already set up. I don't get it and I don't support it. I, and, and I appreciate and I respect what you're trying to do. And I want to make that perfectly clear. But that's my, that's my opinion. You, you've already got everybody included in this. To, to begin with, we know we have a situation, we've had a situation, we've made strides on it, and we're going to continue to make big strides on it. We want to make Vermont a welcoming state, a welcoming community, and, and, and to grow. So in some ways, I think this is going to work against what you're trying to do. So um, can I just want to make sure I follow in terms of when you said that you, that in this draft things were pretty much just moved over, are you referring to on page 10, um, these are liaisons, which are um, as, as needed, you know, liaisons as, as needed, but, um, as opposed to, is that what you're referring to as opposed to members of a, which originally was was the council? Yes, because they're already going to be involved. They're not going to go anywhere anyway. They want to be heavily involved in this. So all you did was, in my mind, is just rename them and and to go and do the same thing. Did, did those people eliminated from the council, or the, again, they're not really eliminated, but from going to 20 to seven, those, those 13, Positions, I'll call them. They they don't have, as far as I understand, they don't have a vote as far as that council goes anymore, and they're going to be uh, considered more like witnesses. Right, and they don't have to attend every meeting. It's right. at, it's at the request of the advisory panel, the council, uh, to request their participation and input. Uh, and they don't have a voting, like you say, and they they're not responsible for putting together the reporting. That the that the seven members who are community members uh, correct. Do we know what the change in the size of the the council does for the cost, or is the cost still centered on the uh, the data administration? Um, I, I see there's members in the moving thirteen people on that should have affected that but was uh, there any minor on that? yeah really minor the the uh, most of the individuals who are the li liaisons uh would this would be part of their regular job they wouldn't get per diem okay. uh so the change in the cost is only taking the two legislators off so it's the two legislators right. times the per diem times the 12 meetings so okay. 
So it doesn't change it significantly. Yeah, so the appropriation is still mostly for that um, data management. For the data management and the exactly. And, yeah. and that, I thought we were gonna have the fiscal note today, but it's gonna be done any day mm -hmm. uh, that will really spell out what the per diem cost is and what all the components of the cost. It's, it's gonna be, presumably it's gonna be less than 960,000, which is in the bill still. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, we should see that soon, hopefully. Yeah, that's the goal. Uh, Tom, no, um, when the, I, I hope I'm getting the right the, the right names for these panels and boards. <laughs> so the commission is a five person commission. No, the the council the council is uh, it's seven people. No, no, no. Uh, what used to be called the bureau. Oh yeah, that's that's the separate. That's not right. That's the second part, which I hadn't really addressed yet. But, okay, okay. So so oh. based, and I can jump onto that, and and then we can. Because I was under the impression, I thought I heard you say five member, and I was under the impression that that had gone back to a three member. It, yes, it has, and and you'll see that on the presumably. Let me see the last page, page twelve. Yeah. Uh, where it's. Um, one uh, full-time, what's called the division lead, and two full-time uh, analysts. Uh, and we heard from Kristen McClure uh, that it's a data analyst and a data steward. Right. And, and the lead would also be uh, in charge of administrative type issues with respect to the council. Okay. And it seems like someplace along the way I heard that, and I don't see the language here, but it, it, um, that it's going to start at three and if they need to expand to five or is this set at three uh there's language that we have for them to look at it not necessarily to expand but to see if they have the right resources uh from what we heard from testimony there's a lot more upfront work and in fact the staff could go down uh once they've set up the communications between these various systems they've done the data dictionaries They've, you know, <clears throat> running more smoothly than than um, than supposedly it will it will go down, and that's so what that uh, Kristen McClure to two or one correct. And I, I'm pretty sure that's what Kristen McClure had testified and to. Is there going to be language that says that? Because I, mean, uh, I mean, knowing government the way I know government, uh, usually things don't get cut back very often. True. But I do appreciate the you know going from the five to three certainly, and you know I. You know, Fiscally, I mean, it, it's certainly better, and uh, and I think three in Vermont is is probably going to be more than enough. You know, when you know when I think of places like Connecticut that, that have three there. So, right, and I think the Connecticut, we'd have to find out a little bit more information. But I don't, my understanding, they have three for the ongoing. They're already, you know, they've already gotten past the startup. Okay, it's heavier. Uh, but on page four, there was language we put in there that asks for a report on the structure and staffing levels. It does not say that they should go up or should go down, uh, but that we need a report from, uh, from the division um, early next year. So that um, any future staffing adjustments, we would, we would make that determination depending on the reports. Right, and, and I could tell you for sure that the, the costs at ADS, at the Agency of Digital Services, which includes a half-time project manager and then a database administrator. And this was, I think, all part of Kristen McClure's testimony uh, that that's a one and a half to two year uh, period of time. So that's not gonna be an ongoing cost, the right. part of ADS. And, and one more. <laughs> um, so that 960,000 that was in the original fiscal note, is that, uh, does that include a five member again bureau? That was from when it was five members. So that'll that'll be reduced by two two full time, which um, I'm going to guess is going to be in a two hundred thousand dollar range, probably. Presumably, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, we you know that's that's the reason we wanted the updated fiscal note, mm -hmm. you know, so that we're not uh, presupposing, and we have yeah. an accurate figure before we actually even vote. Uh, as a committee, uh, that wouldn't be fair to any of us. Uh, but the adjustments have been made, and that's part of the reason why we asked Kristen to come back and Susanna uh, to speak very directly about what implementation of this new division would look like. 
uh, up to that point, it was based on information we had gotten from other reports. You know, so it's 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 honing in on it, and I think okay. we're getting closer every day. Um, and, and one more question is, is that the information collected? Is, if I remember, I heard something that it's not going to be public. So the, the division will be receiving uh, what's called identified information. So you'll be able to, you'll be able to see which person's attached to the various documents. But the public portal, and it should even say in the bill, you can take a look, any, the information that's on a public website or portal is called de-identified information so that yes. it's not identified. With so the, the person is, is, is uh, personal information is redacted. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Higher, higher, or it's higher level information, summary type information. Okay, but the, the general information that uh, statistics may be, percentages may be, uh, derived from is going to be available. Correct. Okay. And, and remember, th those were uh, based on the testimony that we got both from Kristen McClure uh, talking about the CEGIS, you know, the federal related uh, information security uh, piece that we actually pay extra money for uh, to ensure that that security is maintained at that level. Uh, and then the other uh, uh, component that, that came up uh, was from the archivist uh, from her testimony. But I, I think that uh, the combination of uh, folks between um, ADS and the archivist and then we did get extra information from ledge council around uh, freedom of information as well. So that plays into it as well. So we've got all of the security minds working together to ensure uh, everyone's safety. Um, so yeah, Alicia, yeah. <clears throat> Quick question, because I'm, I'm on page four, um, let's see, section 5013, data governance. And maybe I'm just reading it wrong, but in subdivision one there, any data or records transmitted or obtained um, that are exempt from public inspection or copying under the Public Records Act shall be exempt and remain confidential to the extent required by law. So is that what you're saying, like we're de-identifying information before it's public or are we saying that this information is not public, period? Because that's, that's tripping me up. I have, a, I have a real issue with not having any kind of transparency on that data. I don't want identified information. Eric just popped up too. So let me be like, sure, yeah, I don't want identified information uh, not asking that, but there is, just like if I go into any courthouse and ask for a file, they de-identify it as they hand it to me. They take out the slip of paper that's got social security or any other things that are right. not public, then they hand the file to me. So, <clears throat> Is that what this is saying? Or are we saying that no data that is transmitted or obtained is going to fall into public records? I'd let Eric. Eric, uh, Eric. Yeah. I'm gonna need, I'm gonna it's like a surety on that yeah, yeah, to yeah. the extent required, but that's the amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Hi, Eric. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> right Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Hi there. How are you, everybody? Thank you. Hope you're well. Good. So, Eric. Page four, um, line 16, that language. And do you need Felicia to restate her concern or? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, sorry, I, I caught the end of it. I'm not sure I caught the, from the very beginning, sorry. No worries. Yeah, um, so Eric, my concern is, and maybe it's just my lack of familiarity with um, this section of law, 
It reads any data or records transmitted or obtained by the division that are exempt from public inspection or copying shall remain exempt and be kept confidential to the extent required by law. So I'm just curious on two things, which of these records that are going to be transmitted, transmitted or obtained are going to be exempt, one. And number two, what is the extent required by law for confidentiality requiring these records? Are we just de-identifying the information or are we only allowed to say like, we have 500 files that we received from such and such an agency, the information within these files is confidential. So I'm curious like what level of information is confidential? Are we just de-identifying? Are we holding information entirely? And then which of the records being sent to the division are going to be exempt? Right. Uh, yes. Thanks for for the uh, repeating the the question. So yeah, I, I I think I follow it. And the answer is that this sentence does not change anything that would currently apply to any of those records. So the idea before I look at the language, the idea behind the language, and I and this is originally drafted by Tucker Anderson, our public records attorney for, and it's it's been used in a couple of other contexts as well. When, when you, what you want to do is to uh, create a situation where you're not changing any of the public records law that applies to a given document, this is the language that you use. So let's go back to your example of the 500 documents. Everything turns on how those documents are treated with respect to public records law under, current, under their current status with whatever law enforcement agency they came from. So let's say they were at the Department of Public Safety or wherever they were. Um, you know, they are governed by, as public records, they're governed by the Public Records Act, and some of them will be confidential and some won't, depending on whether existing exemptions apply. And, you know, that's would be up to the each individual agency's public records officer to make those decisions, and that sort of thing happens all the time. But, um, you know, whatever that law is, the, the idea here is to say that's still the law. In other words, by transferring them to the division, um, nothing changes. The idea is that if, if they were confidential under the law as it applied to them when they were sitting with the Department of Public Safety, then they stay confidential. If they were public when they were sitting over there with the Division of Public, sorry, the Department of Public Safety, then they'll be public when they come to the, to the division. That's the whole idea is not to change anything so that um, uh, this statute or bill, I should say, uh, will not affect whether the given document is public or confidential, uh, it, whatever the answer would be under the existing public record statute with respect to that document when it's sitting over there in the originating agency will continue to be the answer. And that's why, also why sort of beyond that sentence, um, it says, it goes on to say that the state or local agency that transmits the data still remains, shall be the sole records custodian for purposes of responding to requests. In other words, the division's not gonna to respond to these requests. Uh, it's gonna be that as if the document was still sitting there. It's gonna be that whether it's DPS or local sheriff's department, whatever it may be, the same department that would respond to the request if they hadn't sent it to the division will still um, uh, make an answer and give their, their response if, you know, uh, this all depends obviously on somebody submitting a public records request, but assuming that's what happens, mm -hmm. then they would give, give an answer the same way they, they would if they still held onto the document. Does that help to respond or no? Um, it solves both the questions I asked, but it raises another one, just for <laughs> some argument. And I apologize to belabor this. Um, no, not at all. Uh, actually, while you're looking, Eric, I forgot to, um, remind you to um, or, or ask you to identify yourself for the for the record. I need to work on that. I think because I see people's names, I have not been as uh, diligent. And thank you <clears throat> for clerk for reminding me of that. So. Oh, sure. Sorry. Yes, this is Eric Dispatch for the Office of Legislative Council. Um, Great, thank thanks. You. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so last question from that is, if the division uh, makes a recommendation and uses the data that has been transmitted to them in the making of that recommendation and references it. And let's say 
I go ahead and play a public records request to the division, say, please forward any data file used in the creation of this report um, as subject by law. Does the division then look at all of the data they use and refer that request out to each sending local state agency or initial originator of the document? And if so, are we by nature then making it incredibly cost prohibitive to have access to public records? Because I do believe that if there is an uh, there is provision in law for cost of preparing the, the public records can be uh, an expense be paid by the uh, requester. So if I ask the court for a document, they can charge me the printing fee. If I ask my town clerk, they can charge me the hours it took them to get it together plus the printing fee. Are we making it cost prohibitive for people to obtain records through the Public Records Act due to the labor time of going back to each individual originating um, state or local agency or department of function for the records used in compiling reports from the division? I think if I, if I understood the question correctly, uh, you're asking more now about uh, some data that the division say compiled on the basis of of documents that they've received from multiple agencies, as opposed to say a request for a document itself that they received from the agency. Is that kind of where you were going? Yeah. So let's say I put together a report and I have data from Representative Norris and Milan and Donnelly. Um, and not, and then you send me a records request saying, I would like the data you used to compile your report. I said, well, you go talk to those guys. I've got nothing to do with it. And each of them charge you a fee for preparing the documents that you've requested from me that I used in my report to get to the conclusion and recommendation that I made to the legislature. Am I by nature making this cost prohibitive for an individual to have access to public records that the division uses in their recommendations? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I'm, you know, by not being a public records officer myself, I'm not gonna be able to probably answer with 100% certainty, but sort of playing that hypothetical out, I do know that Tucker said, for example, that if we're talking about the report, in other words, you know, the report that was compiled on the basis of the data from the other people, the report is a record of the divisions. So they were, they make a decision about the report because they compiled, in theory, they compiled that on the basis of the, the uh, information that they got from the other agencies. So um, they would respond to that. Uh, but if it's a, a, if the person who's requesting also wants to see the documents that the division relied upon when they compiled that report, then I would think that the, uh, although it's a may, I, I don't just that. So that's one thing that if you remember that was changed in response to, I think a suggestion from Representative Norris um, that uh, it used to say shall, I'm in, I'm in line one and two of page five now. So division has some discretion there about whether to um, uh, direct to either to respond to a request itself or to send it back to the originating agency. And so I, I don't know for sure, but it would seem that uh, if they decide, for example, to say, oh, okay, you know, they'll make whatever decision they're gonna make about the report, because that's their own document. But if they, if they do end up saying, well, go back to the, you know, the Department of Public Safety or the Sheriff's Department in such and such a county to get these documents, because that's where we got them. I don't, I, I don't know, but it doesn't seem like there's a huge cost differential because that's what the person, the person would have had to pay whatever cost to the sheriff department to get it in the first place. So it may not change anything, but it could be that I'm missing something there. 
Yeah, um, it does say right above the, the division may direct the two lines previous, 1920, and then on to, to line one on page five. Um, a state local agency that transmits data or records to the division shall be the sole records facilitate for purposes of responding to request for the data or records. So I don't know, it, it seems that if a public records request is filed with the division from an individual and the division then says back to these state and local agencies, please respond to this the amount of time is going to be greater than if I just said, hey, DPS, can I please have such and such a record? And so we are increasing the workload and therefore increasing the time and cost of this request. And it just, from a transparency point of view, I want it to be that if the division puts out a report and an individual says, I'm gonna look at that data and I wanna look at that report and I want to be an engaged member of the citizenry looking at what my government puts out. And then they make it cost prohibitive to see these records. There really is no transparency. We have put a gatekeep on it. And that that concerns me. So I don't know if there's a way to solve that, but it's it. That's, that's kind of what I'm chewing on is I want there to be a high level of transparency with this division. And I think that that is the best way for not just the public, but for um, legislators, for our lawmaking process, for every other entity they interact with to <clears throat> really have trust in the data, trust in that division as a new entity, a brand new entity to state government. And to make it an arduous process to, in a sense, fact check is a problem for me. And I just, I, I wanna find a way to fix that. So that, that's what I'm chewing on. Okay, so, so um, in response to this, Ms. Barber also has her hand. Yeah, it is response to it, because I think this does point out something that, uh, we probably should have changed when we changed from shell to may because uh, i think that really the the uh, originating agency really isn't the sole records custodian if if the uh, division decides to go ahead and be the one that turns it over so that language i think is going to have to be adjusted on page 19 i mean on page four lines 19 and 20 i don't know if it goes far enough for your concern felicia but at least that clears clears up that they really are not the sole records custodian uh, once the data is turned over to the division. You see, do you see what I mean, uh, Eric, on that? Yeah, definitely. Yep. Okay. I think that's probably it would be a good idea to run this conversation by Tucker. It's certainly not an area that I would just want to be changing language on, on the fly because I'm sure I would mess something up. Yeah, I don't know if there's a way for it to be like an intermediary level almost. Like if I want the actual record that was sent individually or <clears throat> as, as its own data set, yes, there's gonna be a cost that I wanna make it as at least cost prohibitive as possible as we can in statute without kind of exempting this from, I think standardized statute on, on public records. But if I'm looking for well, hey, did you create a data set out of these records that were sent to you? Can I please have that data set? Who owns the data set if it's not included with the report? Is it going to be the division? And does the division send me out to get the records to make my own data set? Or do I have access to that data set? Is the database its own public record? How are we delineating that? Like, it just the, there's a lot of ticky tacky questions, and I'm not trying to be problematic. No, no, just, we should figure that. We have to figure result. I, I want to take the time to do this right, and and I want to hammer it so it's it's infallible when it goes. So I, I appreciate the time yeah. to do this work. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right. Sounds like checking with Tucker. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. He has ideas. Thank you. Uh, Barbara. 
that this may not be so relevant anymore, but back to the discussion about the staffing, I don't remember anybody talking about um, crime research groups feedback too. Karen saying that often we don't fund things adequately and it, it's nobody is, first of all, if we can't get people hired, there'll be vacancy savings. Um, I trust um, the people who are doing the work to tell us what they need um, and the appropriations committee to review that. And so I hope we don't end up making um, assumptions that it doesn't feel like is our place to make. And I mean, we all want to make sure we're spending money carefully. We also want to get this right. Like, I don't want to half, but it, it, it's true. We will have a hard time getting data, making sure it's all in, but that's a reason to make sure we have the staff that we need to do it properly. And um, so I just want to not uh, be penny foolish. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Bob. Thank you. I've been struggling with, with this, the whole division slash bureau and whatever. And there's many reasons for this. I realize that this is very valuable and very important statistics or, or data that we should be gathering. Having said that, and, and looking at, and, and we're into the weeds on this, I realize that. But I just don't want to be the committee member that says yes or no without some type of an explanation. In looking at this division, when I first think about the division of statistics and data gathering or whatever else, I don't feel that the way that it's set up now is it, equitable or it's inclusionary as far as everything that we're looking to find. I and mean, we've, we've passed a lot of bills here in committee or whatever else. And every time that we do, we talk about the importance of gathering the data and reporting back to both the House and Senate Judiciary at certain points in time or whatever else. So when I think of the division of statistics and data gathering, that's just what I think of. And all, we seem to be focused on uh, one specific group of individuals that we're going to be gathering this data on. And I think that whether we're looking at uh, you know the LGBTQ community, which we talked about in, in the bill that we passed as far as reporting back, we've talked about even the, the adoption proceeding and so on and so forth. So, and then we talk about, well, we may have five people, but a year and a half down or we may be down to two or three people. Well, that's not gonna happen, okay? So what I'd like to see us do is build on this. And if we call it a division of statistics and data or whatever else, and we start with one particular group of individuals to gather that, I don't have a problem with that because all the data and statistics I think are very important information that Vermonters need to have. So I don't want to start a whole division because, and I'll tell you quite honestly, what brought me to this was when, <clears throat> when I asked uh, Representative Christie to send, because I was very confused with all the different groups that we had after gathering this information that we already have access to. One thing I noticed is right below the, the division, there was a secondary division that's going to be started up again. When that's not the direction I want to go in. I want to go with one division, and that division is responsible for gathering all of the information that we're going to need in Vermont. And, and I've heard, well, we're going to start someplace, and I agree with that. We do, but we need a division in its, in its entirety to be equitable and inclusive of all that data and statistics that we're looking for. And I don't believe that in this particular case, uh, due to the fact that Ken was saying, we've we'll got a lot of this information coming in presently, and we do, and I think most members on this board will say that we do. So I'm not sure if this, we can continue to support this division continually down the road unless we start bringing all those other entities or the data from these groups that we're looking for into the fold, so to speak. So I had to kind of get that out there as to we need this, it's important. Uh, and if we're gonna start with a particular group that's, that's fine, but it's a division of statistics and data gathering, and we, we get it from all important entities out there that we need to gather that information so we make it a better Vermont is what we're looking for. This, this seems to be kind of singular in my mind here. That's, that's how I look at it, and, and 
I want to support this. I think we've got to look outside the box a little bit here. I don't, I don't mean to start stirring it all up. So we're starting from ground zero. It's not what I'm saying. I think we can get there. I'm just not sure how to do it in the direction that we're going presently. So I, I, just, I just had to get that off my chest, folks. Yeah, no, thank you. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Um, so, I, I mean, I, I guess I just, it's, it's a question for, for Ken as much as anything for going back. And I know, Ken, you said that they're already doing this. And I'm, I want to understand precisely what you mean by the, the this that, that is already being done. Because maybe it's a higher level thing. I, I really, I'm just, I'm trying to understand that. So the office, <clears throat> the office has already been created three or four years ago um with the hiring of of Susanna right yeah yeah since then it has grown to where um where uh the governor has ex expanded that to three positions right correct yeah yeah we have uh we have filled two of the three we're having a hard time filling the third one Correct. I think that's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. We have a huge problem. Huge. If you go back with the outdated uh, computer systems we have, um, the lack of uh, the lack of workforce we have. I mean, the computer systems are what outdated 30, 40 years to go and load up more, even though you're going to outsource <clears throat> this stuff, which makes it even more expensive, is, is the information is gonna be collected somewhere, more agency of digital services, they're still going to collect it on the servers, on whatever you call the computers, and they're going to be outsourced to this other private entity. So, we're still going to be loaded up. We're going to have um, um, need resources that we don't have to do this. And I, again, I can't say it enough. I want to see this be successful, but going about it this way, when we already have, when the administration already has something that is, is pretty well set up, from point A to point B to where we can focus on even more things to include uh, moving forward. I, I, I just, I, I can't agree to this. Yeah, um, the two positions that were, I don't know if the governor hired them or that, that worked for Susanna, what are their duties? Does anybody know what their duties are? that they would be, or any other duties along these lines as far as collecting information? I know that they're not collecting information. One, I believe, is uh, really focusing on education issues. Uh, and I don't recall what the second, maybe Coach knows. Uh, Coach, uh, the, the, the two positions, basically, the way that they're uh, designed is the person that's on staff now, is the outreach and education person. The next person that comes on board, we're hoping is going to be a policy analyst level individual. So that still uh, puts us in a position when we look at the office and, and the reason that those two boxes, when, when I shared that first uh, map, were in green was because it's work. It's not about creating, you know, like new entities. Um, the big box that we're working on right now is the Division of Racial Justice Statistics. Nobody is collecting that specific data in one place. Statutorily, if you look at the statute that enabled the position, 
of the Office of Racial Equity, it said specifically that that office will do additional data collection across all departments of state government. That was the enabling statute. We never got there and we're not there yet. The goal would be that some of that work will be able to be done through this entity as well as the specific data that's going to be collected while doing the other work. You know, and, so, and so, so that gets back to what Bob was talking about, having it housed. You know, now if, and I'll give you the specific example, if, if this division was housed anywhere other than the office that deals with equity, you could see where there'd be even more question of how do we get very specific data to that, you know, that office, you know? So, so in essence, it, it was, it was very fortuitous on RDAP in its recommendation to lean towards going to the office of racial equity to house the division, because that's a, it's a more reasonable expectation that that office would have a broad enough scope to be able to understand it because that's the way it was designed in statute. And we didn't even fund that to start right. You know, we asked one person to do all of that work knowing full well that it was gonna take, you know, a full office to do that work. So if the information we're going to collect um, say, you know, if this bill goes through, is the information we're going to use to determine policy? I, I Ev eventually, you know, all, right. all data should give us that information, we would uh, hope. Yeah, that was, that was half a question, half a statement, kind of. <laughs> and, but, but anyway, we have a position that's not filled, which is going to be a policy expert. So if, if we put a policy expert into place before we have all this information, um, they aren't going to have the information they need to uh, forward correct policy. Well, remember, remember, Tom. You know, it's a we're we're talking about a like a parallel universe here. The policy work that a policy person would be doing is a lot of what uh, Director Davis is doing now, and it would be shared. Uh, I can give you an example. When the Human Rights Commission went from one executive director to a policy education and research person, it then enabled that agency to be in more places than one at the same time. And because they're directing that same level of work. And, and that's what that office has needed is that level of support to the legislature. And, and just judging from the bills on the wall, I, I don't see a lot of policy. Um, uh, directed at the you know the issues we're talking about, not that they're not important issues. So I, I'm just wondering if there's a, enough policy work to to sustain two people right now. Uh, I, I believe after we gather all this information, there's going to be, but um, I, I question uh, whether there's an, there's enough work there now. They could certainly split the policy work, you know well, and. Uh, uh, well, let's let, let's put it let's you know with all with all due respect, you know, Tom. Think about that's just our committee wall. 
if you were to disaggregate all of the bills that have equity and inclusion related to them that Director Davis has gone to across all 13 committees, you know, of the House alone, forget about the Senate, you know, even, no, I can't say forget about that. They, they are our sister uh, body, but anyways, think about how many times, you know, they're called upon in the total number of bills that address equity and inclusion. And, and that is where the sum game comes up. You know, I, and, I and, I'll I, go ahead. I yeah, and I, I remind folks that, um, that Justice Reinvestment II, um, certainly data collection, um, uh, racial inequities in our justice system, very much uh, a concern of the um, Council of State Governments um, and is guiding is guiding you know some of our our work in this committee as well as other committees. Um, all right, we are overdue for our break since we had testimony. It does sound like we need to do very least a little bit more work with uh, Tucker, right? Yeah, I'll try to please. Mm -hmm. I'll try to yeah. Talk. yeah, and yeah. And then we're waiting for the new fiscal fiscal note. So we have some time to keep thinking and, and talking about this. Oh, that's, uh, yeah. so. mm -hmm. oh, okay. Okay. Great. Well, thank you everybody. Let's let's take about a 10 minute break and we're gonna uh, move on to the adoption. Oh, Eric, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say I, I sent Tucker an email as well and tried to summarize some of the discussion and I'm not sure if he's available right now, but I, I reached out to him. Great. Okay. Appreciate that. Yep. Okay.